Thank you very much, uh, Noel, for putting this uh, plenary together. Thank you for the previous speakers who have, I think, addressed almost everything that I wanted to say. So I can directly continue at uh, Agnieszka's point about the issue of public engagement of anthropology. Thank you for the audience for coming to listen to this conversation. Um, interestingly, I noticed that I do have a regional focus as well. Uh, because I'm talking about countries where I have worked and which I know, Nordic countries, Germany and the Netherlands, which all belong to the winners of the European crisis, uh, which doesn't mean that we would have that comfortable conditions either. Um, I know very little about uh, ESS history or ESS in association, so I will talk more about social anthropology as a discipline in more general terms. And um, I think also about certain issues that have to do with crisis, not only as a moment, but as something that has to develop into an ongoing condition. I was very grateful for Adam to enlighten me about the crisis that anthropology already was facing while I was still going to school, and probably there was another crisis before that. And crisis seemed to be very essential. Um, because I was uncertain about what I wanted to talk, I did what all good anthropologists do. I asked other anthropologists, and I relied also on their opinion. Um, before I get to the sort of title topic of anthropology of, of and for revolutions, I think there are two issues that seem to always overshadow every discussion about the future of anthropology. One is the coming crisis of academic publication, where we are encouraged to pro pro produce exactly that kind of academic writing that is least likely to be read by anybody, and where there is enormous pressure on producing books and journals in a world where it is uncertain where the books and journals will exist in 10 years. Um, I think the EASA has a good record in this re regard because both the EASA book series and the Social Anthropology Journal have shown themselves several times open enough to be not that strict in the forum, but not to force people to reproduce always the same kind of uh, journal. But the problem remains, and I think this is widely understood, that the whole way how science is communicated is facing technological changes that are totally unpredictable. Um, so I'm not going to try to predict them. Uh, the other crisis is more current and more evident, which is the crisis of academic careers. And whenever I ask, especially people who are doing their PhD, uh, what do they think is the future of anthropology? They link the future of anthropology with the very obviously uncertain future of their jobs. Um, I was just yesterday convening a panel where four of five presenters were PhD students. Um, I wonder where these, you know, what happened? What happened to the, you know, how are all these people going to get a job? We are in a situation where, and I think this also goes beyond the anthropology, where there is much, much more jobs for PhD students than there are for professors, uh, regular teachers, uh, postdocs. And uh, I just counted that you could get two and a half PhD students for my salary. Uh, and they would be doing more research than I because I have administrative and other responsibilities. So actually we have an age-based system of distribution of labor where PhD students do most of the intellectual work and where people who were trained to do intellectual work have been turned into fundraisers, managers and administrators of uh, increasingly corporatized universities. <laughs> and, um, and those people who are not good at fundraisers and managers don't get those jobs because, uh, and then they will have to do something else which they might not be that sorry about, but I think that's quite tragic. Uh, now I get to the title story, which uh, is the question of uh, anthropologists' engagement as part of the society. And I think I'm not only thinking about European society as an anthropologist myself who has tried to speak in public. I've also put a lot of emphasis in speaking publi into, in public in Arabic language to an Egyptian audience, because I think that Egyptians will find my research more interesting than anybody else, I hope at least. And if they think that my research is boring, then it probably means that my research really is boring. And um, however, I think there is a very deep dilemma in the need of anthropology to enter the, and the, not only the need, the need felt by many anthropologists, and I think this is much more common in anthropology than it is in history, in language studies, in many other social sciences and humanities. That need to engage a wider public is a highly ambiguous thing. And I 
my main argument is that the famous ivory tower of academic research must be destroyed and it must be defended because uh, there are two movements that are actually structurally very similar and one I think is very good and I, the other one I think needs to be fought. There is increasing public importance and interest of anthropology. I get asked for interviews in my quality as anthropologist. Uh, people in the arts want to do ethnography. Uh, political scientists want to do ethnography. Um, there is um, a growing status. Um, academics, I think, often have a difficulty in communicating what is important about their research to bigger audience, but I think there is a more and more concern for this. This conference shows a huge amount, for example, uh, cases of art anthropology collaborations that seem to be really thriving. Um, however, um, the problem is that the entrance into the question of societal relevance, of having something to say, not only about the society, but to the society, is linked with the other, the flip side of the coin, which is that there is enormous pressure to turn all scientific research into basically research departments of the economy or into consultants for policy making. And this is very evident with uh, a number of research fields. Uh, I can name just three research fields which I know from my own research. One is migration, the other is uh, religious studies, namely the study of Islam. And the third is the study of sort of dramatical political events as revolution. Um, because in these cases there are waves and fashions of funding, and this funding comes with the pressure to reproduce themes, reproduce questions, reproduce discourse. I stopped studying Islam basically because I became so disillusioned about the reality that there are loads and loads of money uh, that are spent so that academics learn to think of Islam as the question and as the answer to anything and they are not given the academic freedom to actually to do research with people who might be of Muslim faiths and to see actually what might be the question and what answers there might be. This is a serious problem also because not only means that there is, it, there is nothing bad about producing research on Islam, there is lots of Muslims living in the worldwide and the religion is an important issue. These are often God-fearing people that must be taken seriously. The problem is that by singling out religion as the way to understand will they want to, how can we pacify them, how can we keep them uh, from uh, fighting us, how can we fight them, uh, creates a totally uh, detached theoretical problems, uh, problematization. We'll have a different situation with migration, where there is a huge amount of uh, resources for studying migration. And I was working on migration for a period, and uh, the problem is that when you get study for ex fund, funds, for example, to study, as I did, uh, the relations of uh, Middle Easterners and uh, people from Africa with the Europe, and migration is one part of this, there is an entire expectation of serving the policies of integration, uh, border controls, understanding of migration dynamics, which uh, I and my colleagues would not want to serve. However, we could also, and I think here becomes the interesting problem is that, well, uh, it's already difficult enough then to take this money and try to keep one's intellectual independence, which is excessively more difficult than one always thinks before one takes that money. Um, the, uh, the, the other problem is that one actually wants to contribute in, to, into a uh, societal debate. However, and I, asked, I heard similar is, uh, comments from other anthropologists working on similarly uh, issues that are loaded with issues of social policy and political contestations. For example, in the case of migration, there is another counter discourse, a very leftist discourse that has its own silences. For example, I had the situation in a lecture series organized in an ex exhibition that Daniela Swarovski, Swarovski and I were organizing last winter, and it was about migration. And I remember that one activist came uh, into the discussion and criticized us for not taking seriously um, the whole issue of migrants, refugees struggling to have the right to have their homeland where they want it. 
which is a serious issue, especially for refugees, for children of migrants. But it silences the fact that most people who migrate or who want to migrate to Europe with whom I work do not want to make Europe their home. They want to make money to have a good life at home. This, however, is a story, an aspect of, my, of migration which then does not fit into a political contestation of European migration policies because that political contestation requires that we take the take certain things, that we, we, that we demand certain political rights. And I'm not sure if I made myself clear, but I'm short of time. Um, so, and, and the final problem is, and it has to do with the study of revolution, and which in my case was a very engaged study, is that there is now huge amount of money to study revolution. And there are funds to study graffiti, there are research visits, uh, there is, it also goes into the arts. In 19, 2013 and 14, there have been lots of funds offered for the research of revolutions in the Arab world. Uh, with the typical slowness of academic research, this research will be done by 2017, 2018. It will be published by 2019, 2020. Uh, that's fine. I like the slowness. Sometimes things take 30, 40 years to be done, and sometimes those are the best things. But the problem is that already 2013, almost all Arab revolutions had been either defeated uh, hijacked by fascism or turned into civil wars. Uh, the problem is that you have um, political interest in things that are so fast changing. There is a presentism, a requirement to serve the immediate moment, that already the moment where the call for funding is out, the subject to be studied has already been destroyed. What are we going to do about that? So um, I think uh, the move into the public, or as Agnieszka saw, the, re and sort of the revival of the tradition of the anthropologist, the public intellectual, it faces these constant uh, paradoxes of being instrumentalized by policy concerns, of having to adapt to a critical political discourse which no matter how much we agree with its aims has its own blind spots, and of having to deal with totally contradictory requirements of this kind of presentism of study, that immediate moment, with the means of your year-long in-depth study. How are we going to do that? Um, and the problem is that we're going to tell to this that it's all much more complicated, which is a very self-marginalizing argument because it doesn't say anything. So I don't have any solutions for the future of anthropology, I think, uh, although, however, that the IASA does have an, a very interesting infrastructure that can be a good basis to develop such reactions. But I think um, in uh, unable to produ produce practical solutions, I think at least it's good to think about what the aim should be. And I indeed think that the his importance would be to take seriously the historical task of the public intellectual who very often has been also an academic, and I think this unity is very worthy of maintaining, which is to provide the society with new questions, questions that question the usual questions that we are used to hearing in the newspaper, and that requires uh, this always paradoxical unity of independence and engagement. Thank you.